this Farmers Weekly Transition webinar, How to Make Money Out of Carbon. I'm your host, Transition Editor Johan Tasker. Carbon is set to become an increasingly important revenue stream for farmers over the coming years, whether it's about being paid to offset carbon emissions on behalf of somebody else or reducing your own emissions. The possibilities, it seems, are endless. But it's a fledgling but it's a fledgling market and it can be confusing and often daunting. So how do you make money out of carbon? What are the opportunities and how do you avoid the pitfalls? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by four experts. Emily Norton is Head of Rural Research, Energy and Projects at Savills. Rory Geldard is Commercial Manager for NRM, part of Kaywood, the Independent Soil Testing Laboratory. David McCulloch is Head of Carbon Store at Till Hill, the Forage Management, the, sorry, the Forestry Management Company. And Juan Palomares is Managing Director for Trinity Natural Capital Markets. We're going to go straight into the questions now. I would encourage people to submit their questions using the chat facility. But first of all, Emily, what options are out there for farmers who want to make money out of carbon? Hi, Johan. Thank you so much. Great question to start us off with. I see there are fundamentally three routes um, that farmers have to um, think about uh, in terms of making money from carbon. Uh, the first is that it simply becomes a cost of doing business. And so if you want to sell any product from the farm, you have to have um, a, a net zero statement or some sort of um, data transfer that goes with it. So you, you simply kind of um, have carbon as a cost of doing business. The second is that it becomes a marketing advantage for your business. So you begin to say you're a net zero overall, and that becomes a, a point of difference for you uh, in a competitive marketplace. And the third, which I think will probably be the majority focus of the conversation this afternoon, is where you're selling carbon offsets, either through um, uh, sequestration or through avoided emissions and registering uh, and selling those carbon units independently. Thank you, Emily. Rory Geldard from Kaywood, for somebody wanting to, to do this sort of thing, to, to monetize carbon, where should they start? Good afternoon, Johan. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that the starting point for anybody looking to um, maximise opportunities with carbon would be to establish a baseline uh, of, of their business today. So that will give them the opportunity to maximise any opportunities that Emily has just described there uh, going forward. So to do that, there's two key areas to to, to conduct. Uh, firstly, will be a carbon audit at the farm so you can understand how much carbon the business outputs so fertilizer use uh, fuel use etc anything which has got a, an emission and then secondly is to understand how much carbon their business is capturing sequestering everyone talks around carbon sequestration how much carbon is actually being locked up and held within the soil and that can easily be done with a with um, a soil testing to understand the carbon stock within the soil those two metrics will give them the the, the balance of their farm business so it's about me me measuring where you are, knowing where you are to begin with. Absolutely. The, 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 the measuring, monitoring and managing is the key thing that lots of people talk about. Getting that baseline from the start and going from there. Juan Palomares um, from Trinity Natural Capital Markets. You're involved in the UK market. You're involved in a number of, number of markets uh, globally. But with the UK, what, what is your involvement? Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, well, I am I am the managing director uh, for Trinity Natural Capital Markets, so I am I am involved in many different aspects. But what I would say is that what we see in the UK and also in other countries is that first of all we ne we need to make sure that we don't leave any farmer behind. So we we cater for animal farmers, perennial farmers, livestock farmers, any size. Um, so that's one thing which is very important. Then the second thing that I would say is that we all need to help farmers to improve. And we have to do this regardless of whether farmers um, are carbon positive or carbon negative. And then finally, what is also very important is that we need to do this with scientific credibility. 
Um, and in order to do that, basically, um, we need to, to gather uh, leading scientists and leading science and the latest technology to be able to, to help farmers and the, and the ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, and as Rory said, it's, a, it's about uh, measuring what you've got as, as the starting place one, yes? Precisely. David McCulloch from Carbon Store at Till Hill. The forestry sector in many ways is further on when it comes to, to carbon than, than some of the other sectors, uh, the land-based sectors that are out there. Can you explain that to me? Where, whereabouts are we in terms of forestry? Yeah, so thanks, Johan. Um, the Woodland Carbon Code was actually set up all the way back in 2011. And so a lot of these issues that all of the other carbon codes are addressing and, and, and working, working out how to um, uh, contend with, such as additionality, such as transparency, um, the Woodland Carbon Code has already established clear uh, rules and parameters which we need to follow. Um, and it's also worth saying that um, not only have the, the regulator um, slight, relatively more advanced, but the sales process for those carbon credits is slightly more advanced as well. So um, um, I'll probably um, explain that more later on in the webinar. And when it comes to, to the development of different sectors, I mean, I hesitate to, to use this phrase because it is overused in many respects, but some sectors are more developed than others. The, the, the whole carbon piece, as it were, has got the reputation of being a little bit like the Wild West, that, that, that uh, there are opportunities out there, but it is um, largely unregulated in, in, many, um, in, in many aspects. I have a question here from Christy Willett, who says it's, it is an unregulated industry. Why would I risk selling, for example, carbon credits? David, can you, can you sort of explain that? Yeah, there's two ways to answer that, Johan, because firstly, I would, I would actually take issue with the unregulated um, uh, charge on that. And in actual fact, the Woodland Carbon Code, it is backed by the UK government. It was set up by DEFRA back in 2011, and it's operated by Scottish Forestry. Um, and the science that's underpinning it has been developed by forest research. So, you know, it comes with really uh, strong credentials. And I should add that it's also backed by the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance. And, and that is an internationally respected um, organization with also very good credentials. So, um, in terms of the regulatory element, um, I think um, the Woodland Carbon Code, and, and I'm just speaking for that because I know that element best, um, is very robust. Um, in terms of why um, should we be selling our credits at the moment, I think it's also important to give you, as the farmers and the landowners, as much flexibility as possible. And so, um, I mean, we have certainly worked very hard in order to develop a, a, um, a process for um, registering and then validating your carbon credits, which then gives you flexibility on when you sell the carbon credits, how many you sell and to whom you sell them as well. And, um, and, and I think that sort of choice is absolutely crucial um, for a, a healthy evolution of this overall market. Emily Norton from Savills, you, you represent a number, well, you, you, you're going to have a lot of, uh, of clients asking you about the opportunities around carbon. Um, what sort of concerns are they coming to you with and, and, and how are you allaying those concerns? Tragically, this webinar is only an hour long, Johan, and there are lots of other people uh, to answer questions, uh, which is just kind of indicative, I think, of the sheer range of questions that we've still got to answer, um, but also um, kind of the enthusiasm and, and the need, I think, to kind of really help farmers understand how they can participate in some of this stuff. 
And a lot of the confusion comes between seeing it purely as an opportunity and something that they want to participate in and a potential way to make some money to kind of, you know, shore up the loss of the basic payment scheme, for example, versus potentially how we're going to be regulated it as an industry as well. So where that rising baseline might be pushing us uh, in terms of um, producing food for a particular marketplace. And it's the interplay between the two that is causing a lot of confusion. The other area that's causing real confusion is because carbon at the moment isn't really legally defined as a property right. Um, and <laughs> if you get nerdy about um, property rights, which you have to do when you're thinking particularly about landlord and tenant, when you're th uh, thinking about taxation matters as well, there is still some gray areas um, around how um, uh, carbon and the system of trading carbon units is going to be treated within those systems. And we just don't know the full legal answer to some of that stuff yet. So there are some uncertainties that it still exist that um, that we are uh, through this kind of process beginning to get uh, attention drawn to at sort of the senior, most senior level in government to say we urgently need some clarification on this to give everybody certainty that this is something we need to do. Thank you, Emily. Um, Juan from Trinity, I have a question here from Kent Adams who says, what are the risks with carbon contracts? Uh, and I guess following on from that, how can those risks be minimised or mitigated? Thank you, Johan. Um, basically, we could think of three different types of risks. So we can think of um, what we call force major risks. So basically, anything that has to do with, say, a natural event or disease, those type of things. And the, the way to manage this type of risk historically in the carbon markets has always been with the with a buffer pool, which is basically is a pool of credits that are non-tradable. They are set aside and you go and you use them in the event of a, of a force major uh, situation. So that's one risk to manage. A second risk to manage is what um, we would call an event of default. So this is basically, let's say, there is a carbon release and, and it's because of um, an intended uh, reason. There, there is no natural event causing that. Uh, and this can be for many different, many different reasons. Uh, any, any, carbon, any carbon code that you go to uh, should have a strong legal underpinning that looks at these events of default and you should be looking at exactly what are the consequences of termination and possible penalties if there are. And then finally, the third risk to manage is what we call illegalities. And what this means is basically you may commit to generate carbon credits for doing something that eventually becomes illegal. Um, perhaps, I don't know, say a type of pesticide, of pe pesticide is banned by the government, then obviously um, whatever you were gonna do in that respect, then you can no longer do it. And that's, again, that's something that should be embedded in the contracts and that you should be very clear when you're entering into a contract, uh, how they look at this and, and what will happen in the event of an illegality. Thank you. Um, Rory, a question here from Catherine Pritt. Catherine says, there seem to be many organisations offering carbon audits and differing costs too. Is there a template to follow so that farmers can assess themselves to see if it's worth looking into the prospect of signing up and selling any carbon sequestered? Well, yes, there are. There's lots of uh, different uh, options out there for, for people, and it's a it, it is a bit of a minefield, particularly on the the kind of um, the the carbon footprint area of um, of assessing the, the outputs on the farm, it's particularly looking at the the assessment of the soils, which, which is where um, I, I can provide more insight. There are a number of different options to to assess the amount of carbon that's been sequestered on on the farm in the different analysis options. Um, I would say that whether it be using a, a comprehensive carbon, soil carbon auditing package, or whether it be a very basic soil organic matter analysis, the, the, the key package that uh, the key kind of focus that everyone always talks about is consistency. So consistent testing, 
at the same time of the year, at the same depth, all, all the factors so that you can compare like with like. So uh, as I said earlier, the, the baselining is, is a key kind of area to really think about for anybody who started on this. So if you start down this route, you choose the method you want to stick with and then stick with it. So you can make sure that as you then you then step back in and review the levels you've got on your farm at a later date, whether that be six months, whether that be two years, whether that be 10 years, you can use that same method and you can see exactly how the business has developed in terms of the amount of carbon that's been stored in the soil and therefore enabled to see how much you've got, to, you know, how much you've increased if you've implemented different soil management practices, for example. So consistency is key. Emily Norton from Savills, is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit like um, any form of accountancy. Um, Johan, I mean, um, you know, it's great to be able to benchmark yourself against how other businesses are performing, but fundamentally you need to know that you were better than last year. So making sure you're consistent in your measurement year to year just becomes one of your sort of key performance indicators. There's no point completely changing that frame of reference because you'll get mean, meaningless results. So it doesn't really matter. They, they may get kind of um, sort of uh, industry coalition around particular standards, but the, the, the methodologies are consistent and, and high integrity enough now that it's more important that you just start. And once you've started, that you're then consistent in how you do that. Which tool you go for may be um, uh, best discussed with your primary supply chain. You know, it's easy within dairy because your dairy supplier will be telling you what to do uh, and, and which kind of contract and what kind of information, uh, which um, tool and what kind of information they need. Uh, but if you don't if you don't have that kind of prescription, then it's really up to you to kind of use it as an internal tool, at least to start with and, and just be consistent. And I guess for um, Juan Palomares and Trinity, the, the, some of these tools are a lot more sophisticated than others. Is it a case of uh, what you put in, you get out in, in terms of the sophistication of, of, of the information? I mean, I, I'm guessing that some of our uh, some farmers looking to get into this will, will find a barrier to entry in terms of the amount of information that they have to uh, submit uh, when using one of these tools. But other tools um, which may be simpler could be useful too. Yes, that's a really good question. So there is always a trade-off between accuracy and robust, robustness versus how user-friendly the tool may be, um, to your point, to basically drive adoption and allow people to, to make progress and to, and to know where they are and how they can improve. Um, what I can tell you is that it is incredibly important to, to the extent possible, be a bit sophisticated. So I can give you a couple of examples. If you are an arable farmer, uh, we should be looking at how you do your rotations because that has a huge impact on how you remove carbon from the atmosphere. It, it's not the same if you are an, an organic farmer or a non-organic farmer. The models are different um, and so on and so forth. And so um, giving data to the extent possible in a granular fashion, so let's say at the field level, is important, but if you don't have that level of granularity, then perhaps we can look at the crop level. Um, and obviously, at the end of the day, what matters is to see what, what, where you are, what is your baseline, and also what is the uncertainty behind those numbers. And for credits to be high quality, that uncertainty number should be, to the extent possible, low. So in a, in a way, it's not quite garbage in, garbage out, but to put it in a more positive way, the, the more information that you put in, the more accurate it is, the more effort you you make in determining that the information that you're using is, is correct and consistent, the better the result that you that you get out. Yes, and the other thing which is important is to, to try to be smart and kill two birds with one stone. So if you have data already in a farm management system, you should be looking for tools that have integrations with those management systems so that you don't have to key that data twice. Uh, and then there are ways to also provide data if you don't have it in a system. For instance, you can do it through an Excel template. So again, basically try to find ways to provide as much data as possible uh, without having to duplicate efforts and 
and trying to mitigate operational risk. Just just to add to that, if I, if I may, Johan, um, yeah, um, Juan made a very good point there about the gran the granularity of the data, and I think just as a sort of a, a comparison, or sort of with it, every arable farmer out there knows that the average yield of a particular crop will vary from yield from field to field. It's exactly the same for what we're talking about today. You know, there'll always be variation from field to field. So, the more data that can be collected, the more data for to understand what's in each field the more the, the less risk people are putting themselves at thank you rory david i mean this is what we seem to be talking about here is um uh actual farming practice is, is the situation different for forestry yeah i mean johanna it's really interesting listening to what 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 we're discussing here because we're very lucky in the forestry market because the Woodland Carbon Code has a, um, sort of established a standardized carbon calculator. And, um, uh, and as I say, as I mentioned earlier, the science that underpins that has been developed by Forest Research. And they've then gone down the path of um, essentially the user just needs to plug in some very formulaic information and based on that formulaic information, the uh, um, uh, the calculator tells you a very conservative estimate of how much carbon the trees are expected to sequester according to the management regime, according to the yield class of the of the trees, according to the species mix over the next 35, 45, 55 years. So um, um, so we, I mean, sort of, uh, we're very lucky in the woodland carbon market to have uh, that um, model already in place, I guess. Emily Norton, um, a question here from Jim McRoberts. Will it ever be possible to standardize the carbon market? David's suggesting that there is some kind of standard for uh, forestry. Is that something that we can see? rolled out more widely. Um, Jim McRobert goes on to say, selling carbon credits is open to mass misinterpretation with a myriad of differing measurements, depth of soil, farming practice, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's two ways to look at it. One is that if you want to do a formal code, like the Woodland Carbon Code, then there's a very prescriptive methodology to go through. And, you know, David, you talked to the cows come home about what that is and how standardised that process is. So every uh, pending issuance unit, every carbon unit, which is from an accredited forestry woodland system, should be, in theory, identical. You know, what we don't have is those standardised codes for anything else yet. Trying to work on one for soil, trying to work on one for salt marshes. I don't know why they haven't developed one for hedges yet. Hedges would seem to be a really obvious way that you could standardise uh, um, an output. But that is for effectively um, regulated um, credit sales. So you're selling into a formal market where those uh, credits that are created can be purchased, they can be retired, and they can be used within carbon accounting, right? So it's a formal process that goes on. Outside of that, there's this entire kind of other world of voluntary stuff that people can uh, buy, sell, trade credit, which is essentially at the moment a, a free market space that people can innovate into. And that's where you perhaps have more flexibility around the particular level of prescription, the particular activities, are you just paying somebody to adopt a minimum tillage approach? You know, there's a lot more variability within that. But fundamentally, it's a free market. You just need one happy seller and one happy buyer who are prepared to pay the right price. And there's a contract between them and away you go. So, you know, that's where perhaps some of the uncertainty is coming from. It's just that ability to innovate into this space. Juan, I, I see you. You you look like you want to uh, come back on that, or at least, yeah. But what would you like to say? Uh, well, I would. I would just like to say that at Trinity, we are participating in a in a an industry initiative with with several peers um, to come up with minimum standards for a UK carbon soil code, and actually, uh, this is now going to be made public. It was actually made public, I think, yesterday, and there's going to be a public consultation. So basically, what this means is that probably by 2023, there will be a UK carbon soil code with minimum standards. Um, and I'm sure that that will be great for, 
for everyone, for the farmers and for the community. That will take some risk out of it, you believe, and uh, put some certainty into the situation? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, I see this happening in the UK. I also see the same thing happening in in the EU. Uh, the European Commission is also coming up with something similar. Trinity is also participating in that. And when I speak with cooperatives across the UK and the EU, many want to, to start generating carbon credits and to see how this works to position themselves for when these codes are live, to see where they are and to prepare, basically, for that situation, for that moment. Our question here it looks um, to me at least a little bit complicated, but I'm going to throw it out there to you and ask if anybody would like to, to answer it. It's a question from uh, Julie Robinson from Roythorn Solicitors. She says, are you making, is there a distinction between carbon units which relate to carbon which has been sequestered, such as through a different approach to tillage or cover crop planting in a year and reductions in or avoided carbon emissions and do those carbon units secure different prices from buyers it's quite a high level question but would anybody like to yeah. like to pick it up I'm, I'm very happy to unless anybody else is is, is jumping well, in there. i'm sure from a technical perspective that somebody can speak about pricing but um yes there is a fundamental um difference between um sequestration and units sequ sequestered and also um emissions avoidance and we don't really see um, emissions avoidance um, talked about very much, but it would apply very much in a peatland context where perhaps you are managing peat badly and it's it's emitting carbon at the moment. Uh, and actually the activities that could be implemented in those peatland habitats would effectively be uh, emissions avoidance in the short term and perhaps potentially emissions sequestration in the long term. Um, that's the least controversial part of it. <clears throat> the most controversial part of it that I've come across from a farming perspective is, for example, paying farmers to use less nitrogen fertilizer or paying farmers to destock their land from, um, from a, a, a ruminant perspective in order to pay for um, uh, avoided emissions. So that's the bit where we begin to get a bit spicy, I suppose, from a farming perspective to say that those outcomes feel more incompatible with um, sort of farming as we know it, whereas a lot of the soil carbon code is interesting uh, because it would be compatible with, with farming. So the emissions avoidance stuff is interesting, but kind of maybe at the controversial end of where we might be thinking about. From a pricing perspective, we obviously um, probably people here better able to talk about how carbon pricing works. Yeah. Yeah, Hank, can I just jump in on that? Um, and I mean, I'm sure um, the um, people running the peatland code would be quick to point out that emissions from damaged peatland currently account for, uh, I think it's about 4% of UK um, greenhouse gas emissions per year. And so if you restored all of our peatlands across the UK, um, then you would make a big impact on, 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 uh, um, on our greenhouse gas emissions. But for all of that, there is clearly a difference between um, woodland carbon units, which are the woodland-based carbon credits, which represented a ton of carbon, which has actually been captured from the atmosphere versus a peatland carbon unit, which represents a ton that's been avoided in the emi in, of, of emissions, basically. the the. The markets themselves, um, the retail markets for these carbon credits, aren't yet really mature enough to under, to have a clear um, view on what the disparity between the two in price is. The latest I heard is that verified woodland carbon units did hear that they were selling for 55 to 60 pounds per unit. Um, and to some extent, there's a scarcity value attached to that. And in terms of the peatland code, I don't think we're quite at the stage yet where there are any verified um, PCUs, peatland carbon units, yet. So that there isn't a comparison for that one. Thank you, David. And, and in terms of pricing, what should you be looking for? I'm not, I'm not talking about an actual amount, but Anne Foster says here, 
fix the deal now or wait for better returns as the carbon capture sector matures? Juan, can I ask you that question, please? Yes. Um, well, I can give you an example. Uh, through Trinity, uh, some farmers have sold carbon credits at 100 pounds per credit. And this was because those carbon credits were removal carbon credits or carbon sequestration. And also, this is very important, they had biodiversity improvements attached to them because we shouldn't forget that um, climate change and nature laws are intertwined. But in any case, in, in regarding your question, uh, what I would say is that for any emissions that you are able to reduce, then you can only sell them when you reduce them. You, you, th there is nothing else. So if you don't improve and, and reduce this year, then you are basically missing out. However, uh, when it comes to carbon sequestration, because when you sequester carbon, it goes into the soil and then you have to commit for some level of permanence of that carbon, then some people may wonder whether they want to wait or not and kind of hold on to the credits. And what you should know is that carbon credits, um, on the one hand, they, as time goes by, value goes down because buyers typically want to buy carbon credits that have been produced recently. But at the same time, it's true that carbon prices are going up. So basically you have like two opposing forces, right? Prices going up and the fact that the value of your carbon credit in theory goes down as, as time goes by and you hold on to it. So you, you have to be basically aware of that. Rory Geldard, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I would say that um, I, I would say that to, to add to to that, Johan, that the the key. Uh, actually, do you know, what? I'm going to say that I think that you guys have covered it fairly well. There's nothing further to add to that. Okay, okay, Th thanks, Roy. Sorry to sort of jump in and put you on the on the spot there, <laughs> but I, I I I guess you know, looking into the future and changing values. Uh, and that kind of thing it's important to 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 um you don't want to you don't want to jump in and commit yourself to, to something that over over time is going to be um to your detriment is that right david mccullough uh, johan i mean you're basically you're trying to balance i mean on the one hand a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and and if it does make sense and you're getting reasonable prices it, you know, it's a very fair argument to say sell now. Equally, uh, people are making very, very valid arguments that the prices are going to continue rising. Um, and you know, I've, I've, we've spoken to certain farmers and landowners who are saying, "Look, I can sell now. I can get twenty pounds for a PIU, something like that. I can put that in a risk-free account. You know, sort of three percent." Uh, compounded for the next 30 years and that's worth a lot more than than 20 pounds so um uh, it's it's got to be up to the individual but the market has got to structure itself so that the choice is up to the owner of the carbon credits rather than this this the the structure of the market forcing them down a certain path i guess um, Johan, if, if I may, I mean, th there's an analogy here to growing any crop and producing any crop from your farm, which is that you wouldn't forward sell your wheat crop from five years time at today's price. It's helpful to, you know, to know you're committing 5% or 10% or 20% of next year's crop at next year's prices. Um, what's really good within the woodland creation system is that you've got um, government coming forward to say they will step in to underwrite the market. So in five years time, there will be um, a, a minimum um, carbon price that they will effectively come in and, and purchase carbon for if the actual market price isn't higher. And that gives some certainty for people bringing forward woodland schemes that, that the carbon price is effectively underwritten going forward. So perhaps in, in, a, in a broader context, that kind of government backing will help give people confidence that, um, uh, that they're not waiting uh, and waiting and waiting, that actually bringing it forward now and having that kind of intervention uh, we'll, we'll give much more certainty. So, you know, we've done it for woodland. Why don't we do it for other sectors too? And Emily, can I ask you sort of on the back of that, how, as a farmer, do you retain control of the situation? 
I mean, is there, is there a risk that you could lose control of your land, for example, which is a, a question from Christina Baker and a similar one from, from Gillian Barber? Absolutely. And it's a really valid question. So I would say uh, make sure you take really, really good advice. <laughs> I would say that because I work in the land management sector. So I mean, it is absolutely uh, critical that you are eyes open to um, the consequences of this, particularly where, as I alluded to at the beginning, we're creating a new class of property rights. You're creating a new class of interest within your land. You know, that, that's not a reason not to do it. That's just a reason to make sure that you've thought through the consequences of that for the value of your land for your successors in title, you know, if you are only a tenant that you've got the landlord's permission and how it's going to be reflected in your rent and, and within that kind of overall relationship that you've, you've got. Uh, and so just beginning to understand that equally, what you're going to be required to account for within your supply chain. And, um, you know, you've got to be aware of all of these issues and the bigger picture um, uh, and taking really good holistic advice on that. You know, if if your business is under financial stress and you're thinking that selling your carbon is the way out of it, that is the point to take some really good business advice to make sure you're not effectively selling the family silver to, to pay for what you need to pay for tomorrow. Yeah. So it's just having that um, that that pause and reflect, take the advice, work out where you're going and see it as part of your overall business strategy. Uh, Juan, um, I mean, who owns this? Emily makes a very good point. I mean, who who owns the carbon sequestrated, for example, the landowner, landlord, or, or the farmer tenant? And are there any differentials between soil carbon, trees, vegetation, hedgerows, et cetera, et cetera? And what are the, what are the liabilities here? Yes. So, well, with what Trinity, we, we, have, we have sought advice from, from leading real estate lawyers in the UK, is that at the beginning of the process, when you when you look at carbon, the first thing to to think about is who is who has the management control of the farm. Is it the landowner, or is it a tenant farmer? And so that's the first step. Then the second thing to consider is okay. Imagine that you are a tenant farmer. Yeah, for sake of argument, then obviously you have to look at your tenancy agreement. You have to look at the reservations in your agreement, at the covenants, at possible termination provisions, and take all of this into account as it relates to basically the mitigation practices that you may be eligible to commit to, to generate credits, making sure that they are, they don't go against your tenancy agreement. And also obviously for how long your tenancy agreement is, obviously if you have to commit for 10 years and your tenancy agreement is, is, is you know, it's not going to allow you to do that, then you are not going to be able to generate carbon removal credits. And then, Finally, what I would say is going back to what Emily was saying, it is very important if you're a tenant farmer that you get consent from your landowner and even discuss if there has to be some sort of revenue sharing in place. Because by doing this, what you do is you basically avoid potential disputes or potential issues later down the line. Thank you, David. Um... Forestry, it's a, it's a long-term game. And how typically, how long are these agreements for when it comes to woodland or forestry? Yeah, I mean, this is, and, and it's it's related to what we've just been talking about in terms of um, um, who owns the the land and 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 what the various rights are, because you're essentially. You're tying the land up in a certain approach to management um, by selling these nature-based services over long time periods. And um, I mean, woodland is, is, I would imagine, probably the longest. Um, I should say that the, um, I suppose the um, restrictions um, associated with 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 operating under the woodland carbon code are actually no different from those that are attached to a normal grant contract although they are slightly longer and the the, the shortest time span will be i would say no less than 35 years and you could be going up to 65 70 and it's possible to go out for 100 years so we are looking at very long time periods and if you're talking about tenant landlord relationship you know, you've got to have a dialogue with the landlord in order to um, to to uh, be selling 
any carbon credits generated by the tenant um, on their behalf anyway. But Johan, can I make a point here, which is where, you know, we can get really nerdy and techy about this kind of stuff. But I think it's really important that we do this right when you when we, we're talking here about selling carbon uh, and you're sort of selling it as an asset, as a property. Right. And therefore it is kind of um, sequestered um, and um, permanent. And therefore we're sort of talking about the landowner's ability to do that. But there are also things that are services and the management related to those activities which the occupier of the land, which might be different to the owner, uh, can do. And I think increasingly what we need to see from government schemes in particular is recognising the value of managing um, high value landscapes that have already received, already achieved a very high level of, of carbon sequestration. So I think at the moment, government is a bit too quick to say these private schemes are going to be what we need in order to invest in these outcomes and are not quick enough to understand that a lot of us are managing very high environmental uh, landscapes, very high levels of soil organic matter, brilliant woodlands, brilliantly diverse places that need management and need maintenance costs. And so the more that we can get government policy to focus on those maintenance costs, the better chance we have of ensuring that all farmers can participate in this kind of thinking rather than it just being an asset disposal question. Just to add further to that, I'd, I'd say as well that um, let's not forget that, that the building up, the, the sequestering of carbon t does take a long time. So some of those time scales that were mentioned, uh, you know, that it, it is a long term project. However, it could be lost a, a lot more quickly, you know, with with bad soil management. So, you know, for people who are doing all the right things, you know, it, it's, it's right that uh, that should be recognised. And uh, is that a particular concern of yours then, then, Rory, that things can go awry very quickly? I mean, you're, you're encouraging a long term outlook in this. Yeah, it's I mean, it, it, it can, as I say, it can change very quickly. And um, it's it's not so much where I think it's again, it's back to people going into these these schemes, everything with their eyes wide open and understanding what the what the opportunities are, what they need to do to manage it to 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 maximize the opportunity but minimize the risk so so good monitoring of um of the of the land the right soil management the right down to practical stuff the rotation cover crops all the things that, that lots of arable farmers talk about in terms of how to to improve the soil health you know those those improvements to soil health go hand in hand with with improving soil carbon so for so for you know to, to link into this the the, the sort of drive towards more sustainable or regenerative agriculture, whichever term that you, you might like to coin, it goes hand in hand with this. You look after the land and you do a better job of um, making keeping it in good condition, will improve the potential of that land to make you a living from from carbon opportunities as well. And, uh, and farmers must must be rewarded for that. So what this means is that if you are keeping a high levels of carbon stocks under your soil, a uh, at Trinity, at least, we generate retention credits for you being doing that. So as an example, imagine that you start doing minimum tillage. The first years, you will do a lot of carbon sequestration. But to Roy's point, you know, then as time goes by, that, that may decrease that, that capacity. But at the same time, you will be storing a lot of carbon that you have to retain. And as a consequence, you have to be rewarded for both the sequestration and the retention. And on top of that, the reduction, going back to what Emily was talking about before. On, on that subject, Rory, there's a question here from Robert Meeson who says, I believe there might be a, a percentage saturation limit to soil organic carbon for any given bit of soil, any given bit of soil. But surely the quantity of soil could be, or the quality of soil could be increased at that percentage saturation, thereby increasing the quantity of carbon in your possession is is that recognized adequately i i i get what he means and it, it sort of links back to what we just discussed now let's start by saying that you know it's, it's down to some of the kind of the foundations of any farm which is you know what is a soil type what is the kind of uh the, the geographical position the, the geology because it's not an even playing field you know it there's a there's a big kind of point talked about which is the connection between the potential of a soil to store carbon and and the sort of the soil type and the clay content of that soil so if you're on a farm which has got very high clay content you're going to have a much bigger opportunity to be able to capture and store carbon 
uh, compared to somebody who's on very thin uh, soils or very gravelly soils. So I, th I think that um, the, the key thing really is, is is making sure that you, if, if you've got soil type information, then you know, there's definitely opportunities to be able to sort of see how much your the maximum your soil can saturate would be. Um, you know, I know there's some, there are some new ideas out there that should, hopefully will come to, to to the sort of come to reality very soon, where you'll be able to look to see whether, based on soil types, whether it's low, medium, or high, you have good or bad levels of of carbon and organic matter within the soil. That's going to be the big thing because once you know that and you know, okay, I've got a a, a sandy soil, my opportunity to to build carbon is is lower, but at least you know. Once you know, you can at least then manage it as, uh, effectively. Emily Norton, um, when it comes to anything to do with money, taxes uh, is often involved. What are the tax implications of uh, monetising carbon? Um, there are um, various tax implications of monetising carbon, a lot of which need clarification, as I alluded to right at the beginning, by um, our lords and masters in order to give us some um, uh, clarification over this. Uh, from a farm business perspective, um, uh, uh, the, the, the primary ones will be uh, effectively whether it's um, an income or it's a capital gain, um, and which will depend on whether you are offering a service or if you are selling an asset. Um, and then classically, the one which annoys most farmers is uh, its treatment for an inheritance tax pers um, uh, perspective. Uh, super interesting. So, you know, Woodland, for example, has a completely separate taxation regime, which makes it particularly interesting uh, for private investors in particular. Um, an awful lot of the thinking around our taxation system doesn't take into account the environmental value of land. It only takes into account the agricultural value of land. And so if you achieve, you know, your agricultural value is here and then you perceive that there's a huge environmental additional value because of the development of these markets, it may be that you are then not qualifying for the inheritance tax exemptions that our accountants love to bore us about over the kitchen table. So what we really need is for senior people within government to kind of knock some heads together and update all of the legislation system that exists around us and controls how we think and do and invest and in it kind of create a much more enabling taxation system. And we really hope that there's a kind of enough alignment now between organisations like uh, the CLA and the NFU uh, and sort of individual NGOs who all want to kind of achieve these kind of outcomes to say, look, the taxation system is acting as a bit of a barrier here. We need clarity and we and we need an update to the legislation to make sure it's it's not acting as a perceived barrier, even a perceived barrier is enough to stop farmers really thinking about this just because the entire sort of advisory sector that sits around us is by, by definition and by, by necessity risk averse. David McCulloch, is the tax system working for woodland and forestry? Yes, it is, in the sense that it's very supportive and very favourable. And um, and so commercial woodlands, and it's interesting because commercial woodlands have traditionally only been defined as those growing timber. But now we've got broadleaf woodlands being uh, deemed commercial because they are um, generating carbon funding. And so from that uh, point of view, uh, carbon income, I should, I should caveat this by saying I am not a tax advisor, so this needs to be uh, verified elsewhere. But I, I don't think that carbon income from woodland related carbon income is uh, um, tax is subject to income tax or capital gains tax or for that matter inheritance tax um, so uh, also not a tax expert but I don't know that we've got 100% alignment on that yet because those tax exemptions were intended to reflect the kind of the very very long-term nature of woodland creation and woodland harvesting and sort of the very cyclical nature of it you know you might only get a crop every 15 or 20 years Whereas if you're selling carbon credits on an immediate basis, it's much more mm. like income. So I think there are um, th there are some concerns there. But actually, okay. the maturity of the woodland and timber markets between commercial timber and sort of broadleaf woodland for, for carbon is, is really quite interesting in terms of how those um, sectors are kind of maturing and they're thinking about this stuff. We see that through our, our forestry work. Juan Palomar, as we've spoken about woodland and forestry being a long term um, game as it were 
Question here from Christine Grange. What's the shortest contract in the carbon market that you can have? You can have a one year contract. Um, but if you want that, and actually that's one of the things that we offer at Trinity, then that's only because you are generating what we call reduction credits, which I think is what Emily was calling avoidance. So basically things like reducing nitrous oxide emissions, as an example, or I don't know, changing from diesel to biodiesel. So those type of practices that reduce emissions that would have happened otherwise, those 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 are eligible for a one year contract because there is no permanence associated to that. There is no CO2 going into the soil that you have to make sure that it stays there. However, if you want to, to generate carbon sequestration credits, then there has to be a level of permanence that is going to be more than a year. Uh, from what I can see through the minimum standards, it's going to be at least 10 years. Okay, thank you. Rory, um, you might be able to answer this, or may, may, maybe maybe not. Maybe maybe David could. But Rory, first, do, does the panel believe this is from Hugh Lloyd? Uh, does the panel believe that there's the potential to add soil carbon sales as as well as a woodland carbon sale on the same piece of land? Um, it, is that something that can be done? <sighs> That's pro you're probably right. I think, Joanna, it's probably one for, um, for one of the other members. I, I'm not too sure whether that ha how that would sit, whether he could use the same piece of land for, for two different transactions. David? To be fair, I think forest research have already uh, considered the carbon that's being sequestered below ground as well as above ground within their calculations. So we're, we'd be a risk of double counting if we work together on that one. Yeah, Johan, you're, you're entering into the mythical world of stacking, uh, which is the ultimate kind of like uh, fun, a farmer's dream. OK, so, you know, from the soil right up to the crop, you have got loads of enterprises stacked on top of each other. And in theory, you can sell all of them a bit like you can sell your straw, you can sell your wheat. You know, they're separate crops and therefore you should be able to sort of sell both of them. The, the problem with the formal carbon space uh, it's sort of like formal carbon credits is is addition um so, uh, is additionality which yeah. is that you you have to be um uh only selling something that the carbon money has paid for so it's not incidental to your other trade it's not something that you are legally obliged to do um you have to be being paid in order to achieve that carbon outcome and that's where uh, we begin to get some nuances around who's paying for what and how but ideally you could argue that um, you know you were selling your um, soil carbon through a reversion to um, grassland, for example. But actually, if you make that a biodiverse, uh, beautifully um, <laughs> uh, legume-rich or so, something unusual, you know, but, uh, a species-rich habitat on that, somebody could pay you for that biodiversity outcome as well. Um, you might get public access over there. Somebody might be paying you for the public access. You know, you can begin to see how you could in theory, layer these things up. But that's, again, where we kind of need government to step into that space more and begin to better articulate how they envisage making sure that we aren't being paid twice and that equally that our supply chain masters are not effectively inhibiting our ability to access these markets by saying you have to do this in order to supply us. So I think, you know, there's, there's some, some stuff that needs to happen in that space, but it, it could be very exciting, the ultimate way to kind of make some, some headway here. Um, David, sorry, um, well, let's go to David and then to Juan. Dave, David, you're nodding. No, I, I think Emily's absolutely spot on in terms of getting to the stage where we can stack the benefits and... A lot of and the the, the formal carbon codes um, work together in order to be able to, you know, sort of we can, for example, riparian planting is is you know it generates so many na uh, nature based services, and um, uh, and and so if we if we provide particular incentives for riparian planting along riverbanks to farmers, then we end up sort of optimizing our land use. And, and, uh, uh, and we do so by providing the greatest financial incentive. Um, but we do need the various sort of um, 
regulatory bodies to work together rather than in separate silos. Thank you, Juan. Yes, I, I was just going to say that at Trinity, we are strong supporters of the concept of blended finance. And, and I can give you an example. So what this means is if there is an environmental practice that is going to sequester carbon that costs you 70 pounds, and you get, let's say, for the sake of argument, 50 pounds through a, a voluntary government scheme, then you still need to, to make 20 more pounds at least to break even. And the private markets can pay for that. Thank you. I'm just looking at the, um, let's have a look at some of these questions here. Well, there is, uh, there is a, um, gosh, they're so complicated, these questions. Should we try one? How do we expect the new guidance on avoiding double counting to affect the soil carbon market? Would anybody like to pick that up? I think that kind of alludes to what we were just saying, basically, yeah. which is that if, you know, if your um, uh, supply contract asks you to be adopting regen ag practices because you are supplying into a well-known supermarket, for example, you know, are you being paid under that direction for the for the carbon sequestration that's happening, or are you able to then sell that carbon to, to a third party as well? And I think um, that's that kind of uncertainty that nobody really knows at the moment, provided the farmer, the owner of the land knows what they're doing and has got that vision uh, of, of why they are selling their carbon, that they're not going to be prohibited or prevented from kind of working into the, the food markets that they are or energy markets that they are currently working into, then that, that's not a barrier to kind of participating. That's just that need to understand for your own business who's claiming that carbon. Uh, is it you selling it to a third party? Is it you for yourself or is it your supply chain that, that wants to take the claim on it? And this window of opportunity that there is around um, carbon credits, how long is that likely to last time? I mean, this, this is going to be here for a long time. This is not just a flash in the pan um, situation that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. This is a people should be looking at this in a serious way. Um, I guess, especially in England, as the basic payment scheme is being phased out uh, as a as a potential. In potentially important income source and increasingly important source of income. Yes, I mean, I, I, if we take a step back, so the reason why we do this, and we are all of us in this call, is because as a society, we have a goal by 2030 to reduce by half our emissions and by 2050 to achieve net zero. And so what that means is that early action is very important for the next, say, eight years to reduce emissions and to the extent possible to also remove carbon. And then as time goes by, probably carbon removal will become more important because otherwise there is no way we can achieve net zero. Um, and then it would have to continue like this. There will have to be rewards for people to continue being net zero because, because this is a job that you have to do every year. It's not like you achieve it and that's it. Every year you have to work on removing carbon to every year continue to be net zero, basically. Uh, I, I think that, um, sorry, Emily, I, was, I, was, no, you go, you go. I was just going to say, I think that the, the great the great thing about, about all of this is, is that there are so many sort of positives that come out, come out of, um, of this, you know, is, is by, by looking to, but for people who are wanting to to use carbon as a, as a, as a source of income, you know, particularly it's carbon sequestration from the soil, it goes hand in hand with so many good practices, you know, and 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 so therefore, in answer to your question, Johan, it is here for for the for the long term. Well, I really hope it is because you know, is is that if it's driving this idea of you know more sustainable approaches um, for for land management, but yet also farmers are able to con benefit from a kind of an agronomic and an economic point of view as well. It, it's a win-win situation. Everyone and everyone comes out of it in a positive light. And, you know, we've seen this at NRM, we've seen this hugely in the last 12, 18 months. You know, the number of people who are sending samples in now to, to get a baseline of data for whatever reason, whether it's trading or whether it's soil health, to, to understand the levels of carbon in the soil is a really, really positive sign, I think. 
like you say, the benefits beyond the economic. Absolutely, you know the the, the agronomic uh, benefits. You know, if if you know, with with the the cost of um, of fuel and the and the crisis we're seeing, you know, with fertilizer prices suddenly for nitrogen over a thousand pounds a ton. If people are able to keep their soils in 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 a better condition and uh, and increase the organic matter and the organic carbon, that will enable them to be able to to that that ground to be able to make better use of the nutrients which are within it. It's cycling more nutrients, so therefore the crops are going to be healthier and stronger. So, as I say, it, it's a positive from from every angle. Emily, you wanted to come in on that. I, I think what's just been said is so important that there's a co-benefit and we don't end up with carbon myopia where we kind of think that carbon is the only thing that's important uh, and actually continue to have that kind of overall view uh, on um, soil health and on system health and on farm health uh, in, the, in the broader sense in order to make sure that we're kind of all moving in the right direction. But in terms of the duration of um, what we're talking about here, um, the, the Climate Change Committee set out a pathway to 2050 where all sectors of the economy decarbonise at some point before 2050, apart from aviation um, and a little bit of agriculture, food production. We, because we're part of a carbon cycle, as we know, we, we can't be 100% um, sequestering or, or um, um, uh, emitting at any particular time. So, you know, we are a residual lump and have to kind of offset ourselves. But the fact that aviation remains a continual emitter um, means that there's a kind of a long term demand there for every other sector selling carbon units should be part of their decarbonisation pathway. So in theory, it should be enabling them in order to decarbonise everything that they need to decarbonise. Are we likely to get there by 2050? Question mark, you know, so how much carbon, how much land use change can we commit to between now and 2050, whilst accepting that the rest of the economy hasn't achieved what it needed to achieve? That's the kind of the question mark. But I think that there is a time between now uh, and, say, 2035, when, when this market needs to be particularly active in terms of offsets. Against that, we have to balance the reality of the situation, which is if we're serious about net zero as an economy, farming is currently part of the problem. So kind of getting our own house in order, whilst you don't have to do it in order to be able to sell carbon, understanding the overall implications for our uh, industry, for our sector, is critical to be able to kind of make sense of what we're going to be expected to do from a regulatory baseline perspective going forward. So this is not just, you know, manna from heaven. We're not just being being paid to do what we currently do. We are all on a decarbonisation pathway and we've got to get serious about that. Juan, you'd agree with that? Yes, I fully agree with everything that Emily has said. The only thing that I would add is that at the moment, the only way to sequester carbon is through, in an economical fashion, is through nature-based solutions. And, and this is why, to Emily's point, uh, the farming sector is part of the problem and part of the solution. Uh, now, as time go goes by, uh, we all hope that carbon sequestration will happen both through nature-based solutions and, and also through technology-based solutions, such as you know machines that suck out uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, but those are not commercially viable today. Thank you. We're, we're almost at the end of our time together. Um, I'm going to ask each of you um, one more uh, question. It's going to be the same question to, to each of you. I'll start with uh, start with David, um, if that's OK. <laughs> it's not as bad as you might think. If there's If there's one thing that you would like people to go away with, uh, this afternoon, this evening, um, having having watched this ses session, having listened to this session, what what would it be? It's always difficult to go first, so <laughs> it's um, also difficult to go last because everybody else might, might have said what you were going to say. But, but so yeah, um, Johan, uh, I mean, sort of representing the woodland sector on this panel so i'm going to stand up for woodlands and say that i do think they are genuinely worth a close look because the level of grant funding that's available i mean the uco uh, grant scheme is the most generous that we've had um uh, at least in the last 40 years um the level of carbon funding that's available and the environmental benefits that you're generating and the internal benefits that you can create towards your farm 
And this is going right back to a point Emily made right at the very beginning in terms of the cost of doing business and whether you as a farm need to achieve net zero. And so uh, for, for, for the uh, less productive marginal parts of the farm, woodland creation is, uh, is a really viable alternative. David, thank you. Rory, your, your message to people in on this yeah. session. Absolutely, Johan. Yeah. So um, again, like David, you know, my, my angle on it is is coming from a sort of the the, the sector where of, of the labs looking at, at monitoring. I think my key message really would be, as, as I said at the start, is that for anybody who's looking to to go into uh, to trade and look at the carbon opportunities, gather data at this point before you even step step in. If you're thinking about doing it, gather that data. So go out, do the hard do the hard yards and walk those fields, collect the soil samples understand the levels in your soil, choose a method which you can then repeat and know where you're at so that whatever comes to the future, you have a good data set of how much carbon is in your soils across the farm uh, and go on from there and using that as a, that same method so you can continue to, to monitor going forwards. Rory, thank you. Juan, I'm going to ask you next. Thank you, Johan. What I would say is that I, I, I hope that Every farmer feels encouraged to to do this. If you if you have a very high baseline, then that's good news because any improvement, no matter how small, relatively speaking, is is going to generate out of credits. If you are already a carbon sink, then that's fantastic. You can talk about that. Perhaps that can be part of your sustainable label. Um, carbon credits is an additional source of income, so that's always good news. Um, back to what we were saying earlier. Uh, if you are doing something that is good for carbon, it's going to be good for biodiversity. It's going to be good for soil erosion. It's going to be good to catch water. And all of this is aligning to the new subsidies and even to the upcoming green loans. So for different reasons, um, I'm sure that every farmer can, can find a way to, to get into this market. Thanks, Juan. And Emily? Uh, start. Number one get on and do it get the information together become a bit more literate get familiar with the calculators know what you can do investigate the options but i think my my main thing would be to say um uh plan carefully on how you're going to reinvest the money uh, because you know you, you may be making money from uh carbon sales but what are you going to do with that that's going to future proof your business Thank you very much. We're going to, we're, we are nearly at the end of our session. I believe we're going to now play a short uh, video, a KWS partner video, one of our transition partners, and then I will, uh, I, I will wrap up and uh, we'll, we'll end the session there. But first of all, uh, a video from our commercial partner, our transition partner, KWS. How KWS, Sewing for Peat Performance, can help growers meet their sustainability objectives in the future. The seed choices we make are fundamental in the UK achieving both its low carbon obligations and reducing the environmental impacts of farming in the future. A move to more sustainable agriculture practices means we have to reduce dependence on often costly crop inputs and intensive production methods to deliver a more balanced and environmentally friendly future for crop management. Advanced genetics have a vital role to play in achieving this mission and KWS's Sown for Peak Performance or SPP initiative puts producing varieties that will help deliver greater future sustainability right at the heart of its future breeding strategy. Why SPP is important? It's a simple truth that 80% of the potential crop production any producer is likely to see is inbuilt in the seed they drill. It can be influenced to a degree by good management, how much nitrogen is applied and the standard of agronomy used. But fundamentally, yield and quality outcomes are largely locked in with the initial variety decision. That's why choosing the right variety with regard to individual growing circumstances is one of the most important decisions growers can make and it will become even more important in the future. There are five key areas where SPP can help deliver a more sustainable future. 
Number one, maximizing production and profitability from available resources. A key future objective for KWS is to help growers get as much as possible from their own land and resources. This can be done through growing varieties that have optimum field performance and yields, but also have key functional traits which make them more resilient and offer added value market opportunities. For example, KWS dynamic wheats already mean growers can maximise the market value of their production through optimising the balance between yield and quality to best target opportunities with the highest return. We're already working on varieties that are specifically targeted to wide or specific drilling windows. This means there's greater ability to use the nitrogen applied and therefore requires simpler management and less man hours. Number two, achieving effective crop management with reduced windows of opportunity. Availability of varieties that perform consistently in adverse growing conditions and can express their full genetic potential in a variety of less than optimal circumstances are essential for future crop production success. Developing more self-contained varieties that are more tolerant of a variety of growing conditions and extreme weather events and less dependent on time critical interventions such as specific spray applications is also key. Such varieties will not only buy extra time for growers facing adverse weather conditions, they will also reduce the man hours spent tending crops. Number three, achieving optimum crop health without a high level of agronomic interventions. Growing plants are more likely to be under greater abiotic stress at key times in the future. Plus, we could have more of the conditions and microclimates that encourage the development of yield sapping diseases. KWS varieties that ensure genetics and chemistry work in partnership to the best effect are already established, but we plan to have many more in the future. Developing genetics that deliver the highest untreated yields and respond in an optimal manner to agronomic inputs when they are needed is a key KWS priority. Number four, reducing the amount of all inputs used and associated costs. Stronger growing varieties with higher yields of vigour outcompete weeds more easily and reduced herbicide spend, plus stiffer straw means you're unlikely to be as reliant on PGRs and achieve easier, quicker harvesting. Varieties that are also more efficient at utilising valuable nitrogen result in more nutrients being used for growth than being lost from the system. Such varieties will not only deliver obvious benefits to the environment, they will also transform production economics too. The less time spent applying agrochemicals and fertilizers in the future, the greater the savings on labor, diesel and machinery maintenance. Number five, getting greater productivity from soils long-term. The key thing here is not to be pushed into having to do certain field activities when the conditions are less than ideal. Whilst good planning and the correct cultivations will be key, choosing the right variety in the right slot can also play its part in reducing opportunities to potentially damage soils by excessive travelling. Looking at variety maturity can help. For example, planting a range of varieties with differing maturities can not only ease the load at harvest, but also spread the window so that you are less likely to have to combine during poor conditions. Many of these developments are here now, allowing growers to successfully align their crop production objectives with their own sustainability goals. But KWS's ongoing commitment to its SPP initiative will ensure this grows even stronger in the years ahead. Thank you. So a video from our transition partner, KWS. Um, it just remains for me to um, wrap up this Farmers Weekly transition webinar, a webinar for farmers seeking a more sustainable future for their farm business. I think what we've learned this evening is that, um, yes, carbon can be complicated, but uh, you can also unpick it just to go through the, the advice from our expert panel, the final points. Gather the data, know where you are, 
benchmark and measure before you set off. Remember that carbon credits are an additional source of income, a potential source of income, and they also generate additional benefits around the farm in terms of biodiversity and the environment too. Get on and do it, investigate the options and plan how you will reinvest any of the income generated. And last, but by no means least, consider woodland for the less produ productive areas of your farm. I'd like to thank our panel, our four experts, Emily Norton, Head of Rural Research at Energy and Projects at Savills, Rory Geldard, Commercial Manager for NRM, part of Kwood, the Independent Soil Testing Laboratory, David McCulloch, Head of Carbon Store, at Till Hill, the forestry management company, and Juan Palomares, Managing Director for Trinity Natural Capital Markets. We are going to continue with this series of transition webinars. The next one is on October the 20th, 2022. We've called it a load of hot air question mark, how to reduce your farms greenhouse gas emissions and we'll be looking at that again as always in a way which is good for the farm business as well as for the farm environment and the wider the wider environment as well you can find out more information about that webinar on the farmers weekly homepage so thank you everybody this uh, this webinar will be available um, on demand on the farmers weekly website but for now i'm transition editor johan tasker thank you very much for all your questions i'm sorry we couldn't answer them all it's been one of our most popular webinars it's a huge topic we will be i'm sure revisiting